Amen. Thank you, musicians and workers. Good evening. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 44. Genesis, the 44th chapter. Years ago, Life magazine uh, did an article about a, a man named Steve Bailey. He worked at the Hershey Chocolate Company in Pennsylvania. His job was inspecting Hershey's Kisses. 20,000 Hershey's Kisses would pass by him every 60 seconds in his inspection statement. But his job was to make sure that they were as they should be. His job was to make sure that the right diameter on the bottom, that they had the right smoothness, that they weren't leaning, and the curl was exactly as it should be. And Steve, as they would pass by, of course, not every specimen was perfect. He would pick out imperfect specimens. When he sees it, he would brush it aside to what was called the catch-off pan, where they would go into a process that was called the rework. Very important, the rework. The rework is where defective pieces of chocolate were melted down so that the process could start again and they could get it right until they reached Hershey's perfection, apparently. The text we're going to read is, we're just reading a, a small slice of a long story. It starts in Genesis 37 and uh, goes on through uh, chapter 45, just this portion of it. Very quickly, uh, there are, Jacob has 12 sons and uh, one of them, Joseph, his, 10 of his brothers hate him sell him into slavery, and he is sold as a slave into Egypt. We're going to pick up now, think about this, what must be wrong in the hearts of his brothers that they would sell their own flesh and blood into slavery? But we're going to read now, years have gone by, 13 years have now gone by, and at, at uh, uh, this time, is this is the point at which we see there has been a rework occurring in his brother's hearts, and we're just going to choose one of them. It applies to all but one brother named Judah, and we see that God has been at work to change them and prepare them for his will. So this gives us hope tonight about what I want to preach about, and that is... God at work. Let's read Genesis 44, starting at verse 32. It says, I gave my father a guarantee that the young boy would be safe. I said to my father, if I don't bring him back to you, you can blame me all my life. So now please allow me to stay here and be your slave and let the young boy go home, uh, go back home with his brothers. I cannot go back to my father if the boy is not with me. I couldn't stand to see my father that sad. Chapter 45, verse 1. Joseph could not control himself in front of his servants any longer, so he cried out, have everyone leave me. When only the brothers were left with Joseph, he told them who he was. Joseph cried so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and the people in the king's palace heard about it. He said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But the brothers could not answer him, for they were very afraid of him. So Joseph said to them, come close to me. When they came close, he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold as a slave to go to Egypt. Now, don't be worried or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. God sent me here ahead of you to save people's lives. God at work. Let's begin. Let's talk about internal blockage. The book of Genesis tells the story of God's purposes at work through a human family. Abraham is where it begins, Isaac his son, then Jacob, and now in our story we're reading about 12 sons of Jacob, who the Bible says they become patriarchs, which is fathers. Literally the heads of tribes, Israel uh, developed as a nation into 12 distinct tribes, 
Each one of these sons was the head of a tribe. And so it is a visible picture of God working his will through human lives. So the 12 sons of Jacob are a picture of God's work in our lives and through our lives. I, I begin, first of all, just by saying every person here, every person watching online, God has plans for your life. There are things that God intends you to become, things he intends you to have, and things he intends you to do. Jeremiah 1.5, God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. But that is true of every single person here. God has plans for your life. And secondly, God can use your life for his will. 2 Timothy 2.21, if anyone cleanses himself from these, he will be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. The picture he uses of people is a container. Your life can be a container of God's purposes. A container is God can pour into our lives so that we can pour out into someone else's lives. And so this is what we see in the 12 sons of Joseph is God has plans and God can use your life. So that's very good. Now to the problem. The problem is that there can be internal blockages there can be things inside of us remember what i said god wants to fill us so we can pour out but there can be things inside of us that block god's will things inside of us that stop or hinder the the plans and the purposes of god in joseph's brothers we see three blockages that are not so different from us. And the first is the blockage of envy. The Bible tells that Joseph's brothers were dominated by feelings of envy. They saw their younger brother Joseph. He had blessings. He had favor. And apparently God was revealing that he had plans of usefulness and so seeing the blessings, they hated their brother. Their father gave, uh, Jacob gave Joseph a coat of many colors. It not only was a fashion statement, but more than that, many scholars feel it was a prophecy, recognizing the blessing of God on his life. In Genesis 37, 4, when his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. This is classic human nature. Think about this. They hate Joseph for something his father gave. Do you know it's possible there are people here tonight, you hate someone because of what their heavenly father gave them, right? There are people like, look at her, like she's all so skinny. And they, they can just sing like their father gave them some and you hate what the father gave this is what we call envy Genesis 37 11 and his brothers envied him envy literally means you feel pain when you see other people being blessed they're not taking something from you it's just you hate that they have it. You, it bothers you. It causes you pain to see what they have and to see what they could do. The problem with envy is it dominates. It doesn't matter. There are people sitting here tonight. You should be concentrating on the word of God. But instead, you look, you look at them. The Bible calls it that evil eye, having an evil eye because 
Envy is a viewpoint. People with envy, it's all they can see here. They're brothers. They don't care about the will of God. They don't care about family harmony. What they care about is why does he get that? And it ruins happiness. Someone's happiness causes our unhappiness. It's all we see. It's all we think about. It doesn't stay an emotion. At some point, it becomes an action. When you have envy, you start speaking words against the people. The Bible says they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Or we take actions against them. Genesis 37, 28, when the Midianite traders came by, the brothers took Joseph out of the well and sold him for eight ounces of silver. They sold him as a slave. They tried to stop. Oh, Oh, dad says he's going to have, have a, a dominion. He's going to have a special place in the family. Fine, we will try to destroy. That is what envy does. It's not enough just to have an emotion. We want to destroy. You know what envy does? Envy, of course, it causes friction and whatever, but envy actually winds up destroying the one who feels the envy. I was reading about a woman, Solange Bagnano. She was crowned Miss Argentina in 1994, became a successful model, but Solange started aging. And when she saw younger models in the industry and all the attention that they were getting that she used to have, it bothered her and so she started getting plastic surgery to try to keep up. It, it vexed her. One plastic surgery, she got a pulmonary embolism and died, 38 years old, left behind a husband and two twin boys, eight years old, because she hated that other people were blessed. Envy. Deception is the second thing here. Human nature often resorts to deception, to lying. And, and let's, I'd love to say this is only those people out in the bars tonight, but these are, these brothers, they were supposed to be in relationship with God. People Lie, they lie to gain an advantage. There are people that's like they stand and they sing holy, holy, holy. But in business, to get somebody to sign, they'll lie. To gain an advantage in some way, they'll lie to get out of trouble or to avoid consequences. I don't want to be embarrassed, so I will lie and deny or we want to maintain our position our ministry so we lie people who practice deception this be, this becomes second nature in everything in life say what you got to say to manipulate people Genesis 37 31 and 32 after they sell Joseph into slavery they kill a goat and they dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. Then they brought to the, ro the robe to their father and said, we found this robe. Look it over carefully and see. Is this your son's robe? Manipulating his emotion for their own purposes. You know, the problem with deception is that sometimes deception works. You can get what you want. Sure, you, you got the business deal. You squeezed out a few extra bucks by lying and being deceptive. You can get people to do what you want because of your deception. You could avoid trouble for a while. But most often, you know what deception causes is turmoil. The story of Joseph and his brothers, the, his deceptive brothers, it is turmoil. And torment, it causes pain for other people when they have to deal with your deception. But worst of all, 
As you practice deception and practice deception, there comes a day when you are the one who is fooled. Where you can believe your own lies and you're in a dangerous place. I'm, I'm telling you about the 12 brothers. They had purposes in God. God wanted to work. But envy and deception is blocking God. And then finally, selfishness. You know, there's a way that you can look at life that only considers what's best for you. What's best for my finances, my feelings, my future. For some people, that's the only factor they ever consider is what good will it do me? Genesis 37, 26 and 27, they catch Joseph, they throw him in a pit. They're talking about killing him. And then Judah says, what will we gain if we kill our brother and hide his death? Let's sell him to these Ishmael, Ishmaelites. What will we get out of it? You know, let's get something from this. Because that's, that's selfishness. The years of torment and confusion that their brother is going to go through as a slave or sitting in prison, that doesn't even register to them. All they can care is we could make some money off this. The agony that their father is going to go through thinking that his son is dead, that doesn't enter their head. The will of God, what God wants, selfishness. I only look at it, what is good for me, when, when I was very young, we lived in a small town in Idaho called Emmett, Idaho. Farming community. And directly across the street from the house was an irrigation canal. I was very young, but the family told me this story. A woman lost control of her car and wound up crashing into the canal right near our house. The car began filling up with water Someone called the police and a sheriff's deputy came to the scene seeing the woman in the car who couldn't get out and the water filling the car. He would not get in because he didn't want to get his uniform wet. My father, apparently, who was working on a sermon, had to come out of the house. He jumped into the canal to help this woman come out. You know, I, I don't know. I wouldn't feel very warm and fuzzy about that, deputy. <laughs> you didn't, what are you gonna do, let her die? Well, she's dead, but I'm dry. <laughs> but, but that's a way of looking at life, isn't it? And so here are Joseph's brothers, envy, deception, and selfishness that has the power to block the purposes of God. Let's talk secondly about God at work. That is true. The story of Joseph is not like some stray, like who could ever be selfish? I have no idea. No, the story of Joseph's brothers is us. Envy, that's us. Deception, come on. You don't have to say amen, that's okay. But the good news is God is an active participant in our lives. God doesn't make plans and then go, oh man, these people, they're like whacked out. Okay, it's all off. No, God doesn't give up on us because of our character flaws. God wants to help us to change, to survive and move on in his will, Jeremiah 18, 3 and 4, this is where the name of our church come, comes from. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the potter's wheel. He was using his hands to make a pot from clay, but something went wrong with it. So he used that clay to make another pot the way he wanted it to be. That's a great picture. Our church is God is at work in our lives. But it's not just a one time and God started and there it is and we're all beautiful teapots. No, there, there's something went wrong 
That's what's happening in Joseph's brothers. God had plans, but their character, something went wrong. But our text, in, in, or that, that I just read to you in Jeremiah, the potter doesn't say, that's it, get me another piece of clay. What God would prefer is to work again to make it the way he wants it to be. So in Joseph's brothers, we see the strategy of God at work. Look how God works in our lives to change us and bring us into his will. You know what he does? Here's the first thing. He arranges circumstances. And some of those circumstances are not good. Bad things happen in life. And you need to know this, sometimes God not just allows it, he arranges bad things. Genesis 42, 5, the sons of Israel came to buy corn for there was famine in the land of Canaan. They have envied and hated, selfishly sold into slavery, lied to their father. Dad thinks he's dead. They've moved on, but oh, but the famine comes. Things are not going well back home in Canaan. You read it when they first come. Joseph recognizes him. Years have gone by. They don't recognize him, but he knows who they are, and he winds up putting them all in prison for three days. They feel what it feels like to be falsely accused and the terror of imprisonment. Because you know what? Trouble can make us think like nothing else. I would love to believe that I am such a good preacher that everybody's like, wow, you know what? I'm whacked out. I'm going to fix that tonight. But sometimes that's not what happens. The sermon ain't cutting it. And so God says, let me help you. And he helps us with trouble. Sickness. He doesn't prevent every sickness. Some people, their marriage is in turmoil. Problems with their children. C.S. Lewis put it this way. God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. When I was a teenager, I was not saved. I came to this church, and if you're not saved, and you come to this church and you're a teenager, you got to let everybody know how not into this you are. Like, I'm so bored. I had no intention of serving God. We're, we're at the house here in Prescott, Arizona one day. I'm in the living room. My parents are there. I don't know if you remember this. This would have been about 1977. An earthquake happened in Prescott. <laughs> Come on, this is Prescott. We don't live on a fault line. The house starts shaking. I'm like, is this the rapture like precursor? This is not good. It's not good when you're not saved. And the house is shaking. It stopped. You know, my parents, they were not one to hammer me every moment, every waking moment of every day. You know, here's dinner, and you're going to burn in hell if you don't repent. <laughs> but they picked their moments. And I want to tell you, the earthquake was like a really good moment. The house stopped shaking. My dad saw my eyes, the terror in my eyes. He just looked at me and he said, makes a boy wish he was saved and right with God, doesn't it? It's like... <laughs> I think God sent that earthquake for me. <laughs> because, you know, God can do that, right? Times of weakness that people go through. Some of the brothers are in prison. People lose jobs. They get sick. And in those moments, they start thinking, how did I get here? Should I have done things differently? What is it that God has been telling me to do? Trouble. That's the one way that God works. Here's the second thing. God works on our conscience. Every person here, you have 
something inside of you called your conscience. Conscience literally means self-testimony. There's a voice on the inside. When you do good, you help a little old lady across the street, you feel warm and fuzzy inside because on the inside, there's a voice that says, You're, that was good, that was a good thing you did. But oh, when we do wrong, that voice speaks and says, that was not right. It eats at us. Think about his brothers. They get away with it. They made money out of selling their flesh and blood into slavery. They lied to dad. He doesn't know. But the problem is day after day, it's in there. It's eating at them. Genesis 42, 21, they said to each other, we are being punished for what we did to our brother. We saw his trouble. He begged us to save him, but we refused to listen. That's why we're in this trouble now. That's what happens to guilty people. Trouble comes because God's helping you. And what happens in trouble? Guilt. You tried to quiet it with alcohol and drugs. If you can just work hard enough, you forget. But all oh, in those moments, it's back again. They could hear Joseph crying. They saw his face as he was being led away. And they said, you know why this is happening? It's still in there. Guilty consciences always spill over into relationships. Guilt produces conflict with other people. You ever meet somebody, they're just irritated and unreasonable like all the time? I predict that's a guilty person. You're not happy with other people it's really hard to be happy with other people when you're not happy with yourself. Because yeah. that's, that's the way guilt works. It's not like, I hate myself, but I love everyone. No, no, that's not what happens. Here's conflict. Verse 21, they said to each other. Verse 22, Reuben said, I told you. Genesis 45, 24, Joseph tells them his parting words as they go back to get their father, don't quarrel on the way. Why did Joseph have to tell them don't fight? Because guilty people fight because they're fighting themselves. Therefore, they fight with everyone else. But that's God. Conscience comes from God. God is the one who makes you feel bad so that you'll get it right. He doesn't want you to feel bad till you die. He's simply wanting you to come to the point where you say, I can't keep living like this. I've got to fix the guilt inside. Third way God works is he has people confront us to help us change. Human nature is like this. We associate with people who agree with us, right? When I was a teenage rebel, I didn't find upstanding citizens to hang out with. I found rebels just like me. Any stupid thing that I say, they go, yeah, that's a good idea. They say, we said the dumbest things, but we all agreed because we were dumb. I, n I never got a quality person. Go, you know, what do you think about this insane thing that I I'm thinking about doing? But God, he lets people in our life that will not agree with us, that will confront us. For some of you, that's your parents. If you're young, some of you may have friends that are godly and have brains. Maybe it's your pastor or one of the pastors who's told you. Genesis 42, 14 and 15, Joseph said to his brothers, I can see I was right, you are spies, but I'll give you a way to prove that you're telling the truth. You will not leave this place 
until your youngest brother comes here. So they have no idea that this man, he looks different. They'd be Hebrews, so all of them would have beards. He's Egyptian, he'd be clean. They didn't recognize him. Years have gone on. He's a, he's a man now, he's a father. But he doesn't know Joseph is working on them. He's confronting, making them face what's inside. Joseph is a picture of a man of God. God will speak through men of God to confront and try to get you to change. Preaching, teaching, counseling, confrontation. You know what it is? It's an outside perspective. You're going this way, it's like, that's insane. That is going to hurt you, it's going to hurt everybody. Why? <laughs> Why are you doing that? Because in your own little perspective, like, it made perfect sense. Nathan looked at King David and he said, you are the man. But see, God's work in us is a choice. You don't have to listen to God. This, it's all volunteer. You don't have to respond when God brings trouble, conviction, guilt, confrontation. But if you don't, God has the right to stop speaking to you. And for some people, unfortunately, it leads to destruction. John 13, 27, when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him and Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. In Alaska, there's a place called Turnagain Pass. Lots and lots of snow. A few years back, there were danger signs of avalanches. Eight feet of new snow had fallen on snow that was already packed down. You know, that's what an avalanche is. It slides. It breaks friction. Usually the newer snow breaks away and slides down the hill. A warm sun had been beating on it all day. That's what causes avalanches. They even had avalanche warnings. But for snowmobilers, they had a great idea. Let's see who can go highest on the mountain. On the way up the mountain, they saw a small avalanche in a gully as they passed it. Did that stop them? No, sir. They kept on going, and then a mile-wide wall of snow came racing down the mountain and buried all of them. And they died. That sometimes is what happens. Because God loves you, he works. He confronts. He causes guilt, so you want to fix it. All the, You don't have to. And unfortunately, it can bring destruction. Let's close. One last thought. Let's talk about the blessings of repentance. Having just told you about the possibility of destruction, I tell you, destruction is not automatic. It is not every single person. The moment you step out of line, you're dead. That is not the will of God. It is possible to change the point of trouble and confrontation and guilt is to help us change. Luke 22, 31 and 32, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you so that your faith should not fail. And when you have repented and turned back to me again, strengthen your brothers. Simon, I know what's going on in your heart right now. You're going to make bad decision, but that doesn't have to be the end. I choose just one of the ten brothers that were involved in tormenting Joseph. Let's choose Judah. Judah shows what happens when people repent. Repentant people 
see themselves correctly. Genesis 42, 21. They said to each other, we are being punished for what we did to our brother. We saw his trouble. He begged us to save him, but we refused to listen. That's why we're in this trouble now. Now it is they are getting honest. They lied to dad, but now they're getting honest. They're saying, we did wrong. Because there's something in the human heart, we don't want to admit it. We, we like to, I made a little, a slipsy. No, I was wrong. Just say it. Because that's what repentance is, is to change your mind first. No excuses, no blame. We're wrong. Number two, repentant people change their actions. Genesis 42, 33, and 34. So now please let me stay here and be your slave and let the young boy go home to be with his brothers. I cannot go back to my father. The boy isn't with me. I couldn't stand to see my father that sad. Before he could hold up a blood-soaked robe and lie through his teeth seeing his father's agony. But now something has changed. He said, I don't want to live like that anymore. If I have to be a slave, let me be a slave, but I can't. I am not going to live as a liar anymore. I am not going to live hurting people anymore. That's repentance. You change your mind, you own up so that you change your actions. I want to stop doing wrong and I want to try to make things right. But in Judah we see when people repent it births very good things. Healing is brought to our hearts. How wonderful it is to feel clean. That, that's, that's what I can tell you living as a rebel, knowing right, doing wrong, all the guilt that I carried what a wonderful feeling it is when you fix it and you get that off your chest. There are some of you who come to church, I feel sorry for you. You are so miserable being here. You're not happy. You're not brave enough to say, I'm out of here, I'll go to hell. But you're not happy. You're not alive on the inside. It has, no, it has no appeal to your soul. But oh, when you repent and get it right. You know what it's like to come to church, you feel clean. You look people in the eye. You can sing and worship, you feel alive. Healing is brought to your heart. Healing is brought to relationships. Genesis 45, 15, Joseph kissed all his brothers. He cried as he hugged them. And after this, his brothers talked with him. When people get right with God, they get right with people. Third thing is that God identifies with people who repent. Revelations 5, 5, the angels say something about Jesus Christ and they say, he is the lion of of the tribe of Judah. Judah, the deceitful, envy-filled, selfish man, but he changed. Here, here's past. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think that Jesus would find some perfect specimen? I'm the lion of the tribe of the perfect guy. But he says, I'm the lion of the tribe of Judah. Do you know that if you have messed up or you're not where you should be tonight, do you know that God still wants to identify with you? He doesn't want to give up on you. And finally, repentance births usefulness. Genesis 49, 8 and 10. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall all bow down before you. Genesis 49, 10. The scepter, 
That's the symbol of authority. Shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of all the people. This is prophetic, saying, Judah, from your life, because you repented, God is going to birth usefulness. King David was from the tribe of Judah. That became the ruling tribe. Because when you repent, remember what we said God wants to do? He wants to fill your life so you can pour out into other people good things. I close with this story I was reading. This is a pastor named Bob Alberg. Quite amazing. It's a, a congregational church in Illinois. I didn't know any other church did this. But he told about a man in their church. It came out that this man had been committing adultery repeatedly for some amount of time. They brought him before some of the church elders and they disciplined him according to Matthew 18. They told him, we are putting you out of church. And when they told him that, this man said, I know what I'm doing. You do what you have to because I don't care. I never plan on coming to this church again anyway. So why should I care? The man divorced his wife. She kept attending church. But two years later, this man, he said that the Holy Spirit, the hound of heaven, had been on his trail for two years. Not long after he was put out of the church, he was in the army reserves, he was sent to Iraq during the Iraq war. And his job in Iraq was to process the dead bodies of soldiers who had died in Iraq. So every day he's in Iraq, God is working on him. He's seeing young men who have died. Their life was short. And knowing that they are now in eternity. And he said, I can't take it anymore. Two years later, he asked to meet with the pastor of the church. Bob Alberg and some of the elders, he confessed his sin. He wept and asked to be forgiven of his arrogance. Said he's sorry for the impact his sinful life had had on his wife and on the church. The transformation in him was so great, he and his wife wound up getting remarried and they allowed him to come back to church. That is a modern day example of all that I just preached to you. God at work. I'm not giving up on you. I want to work my purposes in your life. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place. Right now, there may be people that are here I spoke of being right with God and how terrible it is to have to carry guilt and shame. Some of you, that is your life story, isn't it? You've done what you wanted to do, but long after the deed is over, you are still carrying the shame. Some of you have to resort to alcohol and drugs. Some of you work as hard as you can. I can keep busy. I don't have to think about what I am on the inside. But I am telling you about the love of God. There's hope for guilty people. And that's Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid in blood. He died in your place and my place so that we could go free. And I'm asking right now, how many people are here? You say, I want to feel clean like you said, Pastor Greg, I want to feel alive when I come to church. I want to feel clean in the presence of God. I need to be changed. I want to repent, which means I see the way I'm living is wrong, and I want to change my actions. If you want to repent tonight in prayer, you want to pray with an honest heart, do this. Lift up your hand. By lifting your hand, you're saying, Pastor Greg, I need to be saved. How many would there be? Hold your hand up so I can see it. 
I'm not right with God, and I know that. Thank you. God bless you, man. How many others? God bless you. Thank you. I appreciate these being honest. Lift up your hand. How many others? Lift it up high so I can see it. Pastor Greg, I need Jesus. You need to go on record. I don't want to live like this anymore. Hold up your hand. God loves you. He has not given up on you. God can save you in a moment's time and change you from the inside out. You can know the joy of sins forgiven. How many here? Anybody else? Lift up your hand. Join the, these. Or maybe you're backslidden. This is what happens to backsliders. I see that hand. Thank you. You can turn away from God, but it eats at you inside. Backslider, you can fix that tonight. How many others? Lift up your hand. God's dealing with people. I feel the Spirit of God here. Hold it up, put it right back down. I need to get right with God. Thank God. I want those that lifted their hand, nobody else, if you lifted your hand, look up at me. Amen. Look at me for a minute. You meant that? Yes. You meant that over there? Yes. Come here. I'm going to have somebody pray with you. Get out of your seat. Come here. Someone's going to pray with you. God bless you. Appreciate you being honest. Amen. Just kneel down at the front. There you go. Help them to pray. God bless you, man. Just kneel down. There are others that need to respond. God bless you. Thank you. Bring them down. He's going to pray. If there's somebody near you that doesn't know Jesus, please turn to them. Help them have the courage to pray and get right with God. Them believers, I'm going to open the altars. God at work. Some of you, God has been at work, hasn't he? Trouble, conscience, confrontation has been coming into your life. But you have to respond. God won't make you. It has to be you that says, enough. I need to do the will of God. I need to get right with God. Let's all stand up to our feet. I'm opening the altars. I'm inviting you to come and pray. Talk to God. Tell God, I want to do your will. God, help me to change whatever it is that's keeping me from doing your will. Help me to change. Tonight, let's do that. They're going to sing while people are coming. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. Father God, deliver, and I pray, Lord God. Spirit within me. Cast me not away, away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore
cast me not away. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Let's praise God together right now. Father God, I thank you. Hallelujah, Lord God, hallelujah. God, we thank you for your faithful love, Lord God, hallelujah. Praises, praises be unto God. Thank God. Amen. If God spoke to you about things that you need to fix or to change when you leave here, do that so that God is able to fully work his will in your life. Amen. We're going to be dismissed, reminding married people.